So we're on episode six of the questions and answers, and this one, the first question has come from Andrew, and he wants to know what kind of files and RASP do you do recommend for a beginner? Well, the reality is you want to buy the best you can, and um, so it's not a question of stair-stepping uh, stair this through to a more advanced level, except that a good RASP can cost you upwards of $100 or £100, and um, they can get very expensive. So what do we use RASPs for? What do we use files for? We use files and RASPs for all types of shaping work that we do within woodworking. We use them to sharpen some metal edge tools. We use them for scrapers and things like that. So the files, I've, I haven't found any better files really than Baco files. This is a Swedish company. Um, they make good files that last a long time. So whether you're saw sharpening or, or filing wood, which we often do, then you can't beat Baco files. I think they're excellent quality files and they last well. They last better or as well as any that I've ever tested. Um, I also use Tome Fatira files and I think they're very good files too. So you could go either way. Both of them are made in Portugal, so makes very little difference. Um, when it comes to rasps though, the difference prob probably I should explain, what a, a file is generally is a very wide tooth. If you think of it more like a saw, it has these very wide teeth that go across the full width of the file. I'm talking about a single cut file. Uh, so on this one, well, you can't really see that clearly, but these teeth go all the way across uh, and we use it for a clean cut that we get on the wood. Now on this one here, I've got a fairly coarse file here, um, rasp here. What these are are tiny barbs that go into, they cut into the surface of the steel and then uh, we use those tiny barbs to cut the wood and, and rasp uh, cut the wood. They're quite crude compared, especially if they're machine cut. This is a machine cut. You'd think a machine cut wouldn't be as good as a, a hand cut. This is a hand cut rasp. This, every one of those little tiny teeth has been hand cut with a, with a cutting tool and a hammer. Every one is cut by hand to a certain shape. So what they do is they remove material from wood. So here's the coarse one. We use this like this and it cuts the wood quite rapidly. So if you're making the back of a spoon or something like that, you can remove stock very quickly and does it matter if it's coarse? Well, it does, ultimately. Here's a finer one. And here, this one is refining that. So you could have a, a less expensive one and then follow on with this one. But the advantage of this is this will last 10 times longer than this one. It will last. So it's, a, it's not really any more economical. But when you're starting out, yes, that would be a good way to go. Start out with a backhoe file. Backhoe files are not very expensive, 10 pounds for a flat file, seven or eight pounds for a file that will sharpen your saws. So those are the, the, the my preferred ones. You can get another two makers for the rasp. You've got, this is um, an Oreo rasp. You can go with Logier, and there's also Tome Fatera again. So those will give you good tools to get started with. Let's see what the next question is. Okay, this one's from Dan. What are the standard proportions for wedged tusk, tusked tenons? Well, there is no standard size. There is no standard proportion. Uh, you'll find books on it. You'll find people saying that this is a standard proportion, but there isn't really one. And this is what a tusk tenon is. The reason it's called a tusk tenon is because, I mean, uh, yeah, tusk wedge. It's the wedge itself that's actually shaped like a tusk, not the tenon itself but we use it on different um, applications than say for making doors, the corners of chairs, uh, window frames, window sashes and things like that. This is a different tenon. This is where we have a larger section of wood, maybe like this where we have a leg and then we have the tenon going through this way and then we have a hole through the tenon on the exit side where we drive a tusk, uh, a, a wedge in the shape of a tusk, a, a walrus tusk. So this goes through, so it's very different. So your tusk tenon can be just about any width you want. I would say that it would depend, most 
um, sections that you're going to drive a tusk tenon through are going to be two inches, two and a half inches wide. So I would go with a three quarter inch, half inch to three quarter inch tusk tenon, uh, tusk wedge will be all you ever need to wedge that tenon. So that would, that would work perfectly. Now proportionally, you may want to go with something bigger, but it wouldn't give you any added advantage over a thinner wedge. So it's, it's proportional, it's how it looks, it's aesthetic. That's what we would be searching for if we did that. Thank you, Dan, that was a great question. Uh, Kevin, one of your blogs states that laminated wood does not last as long as solid wood, even for indoor applications. For example, trestle table legs. Should laminated wood always be avoided in furniture making? Well, that was a bit of a broad sweep that I made with that one, and I'm sorry I said it that way. Um, I was simply uh, reflecting on pieces that I have made outdoors where I've made, say, a garden bench or something like that, and I've laminated two sections to make a leg. Within five or six years, usually those laminations, the sections have expanded, contracted, expanded, contracted, a little bit of moisture in the joint, and eventually, no matter, anybody tells you waterproof glue, all of those, they do ultimately yield to this expanding and contraction motion that takes place in the wood. On a tabletop, you're saying laminated tabletops. Laminated tabletops go back two, three hundred years. I think it was very common, and we have very good glues today that do last, but even the animal hide glues, the oldest glue in the world, did hold up to lamination. So we do use it to get that expanded width. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to do a solid tabletop three feet wide. So we do have to rely on laminations. Maybe one day you'll have to go back to a laminated top. I've never had to do that myself, but I have seen laminated tops separate and come apart. And a lot of it has to do with the atmosphere that this particular piece is going in. You've got seven people in a household um, they're all using showers, you're cooking for seven people, you've got steady seven body temperatures giving off moisture the whole time. All of these things affect the atmospheric moisture in the house itself. If you have one elderly person on their own, they're not going to give off very much um, uh, moisture into the atmosphere. So it varies according to the household, it varies if it's in the kitchen, it varies if it's in the bathroom. These are the things that will affect your decision. No fixed answers, I'm afraid. Okay, how, Mark, this is, how would you make a right angle triangle bead strip using only hand tools? I'm using a softwood like cedar. Any help is appreciated. Okay, let me give you my answer. If I needed a, tri a, a triangle, no matter what size it was, let's say I wanted three quarters. This is three quarter inch stock. I run a piece of a line along here like this. I join this corner to this corner, just like this. I'll have to have the line on my side. And then take a handsaw, go from that opposite corner, and cut all the way down your piece of wood, just like that, until you've got to the opposite end. And then there's a couple of things you can do to plane that. You can drop it into the vise like this. So you've got a long length, remember. You hold it here, you take a shaving off, move it along, take another shaving off, take another shaving off, and that would work perfectly. So you can do that. How accurate that would be, that would be entirely up to you. There are ways that you could suspend that, that you could get it pristinely accurate all the way along. But that will give you a guide in what you can do to make that work. Okay, this is a good question too. This is from Matt. I've been working some hard hardwoods with a sharp, well-set plane if I come at the wood from the end, so the blade is behind the wood, and then hit, and then hits it, I can get some shavings. But if I start in the middle of the piece of wood, it just rides the surface instead of cutting into it. 
any thoughts i do have thoughts on this sharpness is the key and you say that you've got a sharp well set plane well i'm going to try to give you what i think could be happening here with an illustration that i think will help you often we sharpen our planes to this very precise 25 degree bevel and then we come in with a 20 uh, uh, an another angle on here we go to 30 so we end up with a cutting edge something like this on a lot of plain irons now I don't do that I just sharpen mine at 25 degrees and then I hone it and I usually lift up slightly so I end up at 30 degrees on the very cutting edge and I end up with a camber on here and this works perfectly and it's worked for me for 50 years and it works for a lot of other people too but uh, um, ignoring what method we've got what happens after this point here regardless of which one you use we often go to the strop excuse me we often go to the strop. So we've got the plain iron. Take the plain iron out of the plane. And this is probably, I'm guessing this is what's happened. When you start stropping on the strop here, a lot of times, this is what students do all the time, they're pulling here and right on the very close, can you see my angle shifted from 30 here? I pull and I do this. <coughs> like this. And I'm rounding the end of the plane. The blade is still sharp, but it's moved the bevel. It's moved that bevel up onto the edge. So when it hits the wood, it has no con contact with the wood. But when I push it on the end, give you a, a visual on this. If I take the iron on here, let's say that I now have a much steeper bevel. The bevel is up here. So when it's actually offered in the plane, it's offered at this bevel here of 45 degrees when it's offered to the wood. But the problem is it's rounded this edge so the bevel is not actually hitting the wood the cutting edge is not hitting the wood whereas when i start back here it does hit the wood so it's taking that initial shaving right at the beginning but then it's riding the bevel the whole time so you've got to make sure that when you're stropping you never strop more than 25 degrees because when you pull the strop the blade across the strop this leather is bulbing up underneath so it's actually making it even worse so as you pull across here it bulbs up so keep this low keep it 25 degrees and strop at 25 degrees that will compress the whole bevel into the uh, strop and it will polish that bevel to the bevel you want try that and see if that doesn't correct it let me know please I'm pretty sure it will it's a very, very common <laughs> mistake with students. So I hope that answered that. Okay, what's the essential difference between window glass cleaner and auto glass cleaner for use with diamond stones? I've gone through this. He's using Windex, which I don't think there's anything wrong with using Windex. It just smells differently. I don't like the smell of Windex. And also it has a little bit more soapiness to the Windex. I don't think it matters what you use. You can use just about any liquid, water if you want to. But what I've found with the wind with the uh, diamond, the auto glass cleaner, is it doesn't rust the stones. You're saying I think that your Windex doesn't rust the plates too. So I think it's fine to go with whichever one you want. Water tends to disappear too quickly for me too. Okay, Chris. What's the best finish to use on a table such, top such as a coffee table to protect it from cuts and spills and marks from objects on the surface? I'm making one from oak. I have oak kitchen sideboards that's finished with five coats of Danish oil and still managed to get a black mark on it when a tin can, when a tin can was left on the surface. 
it's a horrible feeling when you see it, you know it's gone deep into the wood. Often that wood has had some kind of reaction, it's got tannic, tannic acid in the wood and it reacted to the tin can which is steel and it's caused this black ring in there and it's gone deep in the wood. Um, Danish oil is not really a, a finish like polyurethane or varnish. Danish oil is a composition, it can be made from several different oils. The original Danish oil I think was tongue oil mixed with some uh, polyurethane and then some other additives that were designed to evaporate the solvents that were, they were used to evaporate more quickly and dry off more quickly. Tongue oil on its own I think takes a long time to dry. It's very durable, very hard. <coughs> so I think one of the best finishes for a dining table in terms of protection, you can't beat polyurethane. Lacquer dissolves with the skin, the acids in your skin when you put your hands on the table for a year. On the edge of the table that starts to go gummy. You don't get that with polyurethane. The only problem with polyurethane is you build up the coats, you get enough protection on there and it feels like plastic. That's the only downside. But you can buff it out and you can use beeswax on top of it and it does feel better. But I think polyurethane is probably one of the best uh, furniture finishes in an age when we don't want to protect the furniture that we love and we work on and we make. I like shellacs, I like um, French polishing, I think it's a lovely finish. The problem is for this age where people want an easy finish to spray uh, polish on the furniture, it doesn't work too well. I'm not sure how to pronounce this name so I'm not going to. How do you clean up reused tools and materials used for applying stains and finishes? Very carefully, um, we've come across this, uh, uh, tools such as scrapers, applicators, brushes and so on should be cleaned with the solvents that you use to thin the material you're working with. So with polyurethane you might use mineral spirits, um, whatever it is, turpentine that you've got in the finish itself, the solvent that you use for that. If it's shellac then you would use uh, denatured alcohol. Uh, if it's a water-based finish, then you would use water. Once water-based finishes have um, cured, you can't go in and re re uh, resolve it. The solvent won't, the water base won't go back in and do that. And that's the same with a lot of finishes. So the best thing is to clean up straight away. I hope that answers your question. You do have to be careful with oil-soaked rags to make sure that you clean them thoroughly don't leave them around, they can spontaneously combust and we try to address that every time. Take them outdoors, lay them on a, a, an open uh, cement path or something, put a weight on it and let them dry outside and then dispose of them according to your local county council um, guidelines. I can sharpen scrapers to produce a nice shaving but the edge doesn't last very long. And this is from Ed, who I know, he's a friend of mine in America. How long will your scraper cut well on oak, maple after sharpening? Quite a long time, Ed. And um, I think that what we sometimes do with the edges, we, uh, let me see what I've written here. Let me, most likely the angle of the turn is the problem in the first, in the first question, rather than the holder itself. So. Sometimes we don't turn the edge quite enough before we actually get to turn the edge. So when we get the scraper, if we have one, and we've got the burnisher, we might take a burnisher and consolidate the edge here at 90 degrees or even on a 45 degree one like in the cabinet scraper. We consolidate the steel, but instead of consolidating, we actually turn the edge too soon. So we start off at an angle, and then that angle doesn't have any buildup of steel behind it. So it's better to start off here, consolidate so we get a T uh, uh, shape, like this. So here's the square edge here. We're consolidating with the burnisher on here, so we keep it square like this. But when we keep consolidating, boom, 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 we're actually creating this shape on the edge here. So it's consolidating into itself like this. 
And what we want to do is keep consolidating more and more, and what we end up with is, we end up with the T like this, but we start to turn this edge here, not too much, and we end up with more steel behind the very cutting edge in a continuous mass of steel. And I think that's usually what happens. We turn too soon and that edge becomes fractious. It's not really been consolidated. And that's my theory. So we're about done with this session and they're great questions and we need those good questions because not only are you helping us to answer the question, you're helping hundreds and thousands of other woodworkers to resolve these unasked questions that still need answering. Thank you for helping us. Great, I'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.